Cause tiny home grew so large The tree, the ground did smoke Tiny faith A tree of life Something I doubt couldn't shake Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the podcast for Without Spot or Blemish Ministry. So glad you're here today. And today is Saturday, July 21st, 2018. And that means Shabbat Shalom. This is a Sabbath message. And today we're going to talk about how to know how to give in these last days. How to know who to give to, how to give, when to give, how much to give in terms of your tithing or however you want to call it some people believe that tithing went away with the old testament there's all kinds of uh arguments over what tithing is or what giving is and one thing's for sure that the new testament does establish that we do give to ministries and who do you give to and how do you give to them and how much do you give them and let's talk about that let's also talk about it from the minister's perspective and how the minister should look on giving and and the expectation of God's provision and how to have faith in these last days when money may not abound, but you feel God calling you to go into ministry in spite of that and to trust in Him. We'll talk a lot about that in this episode as well, so stay tuned. But before we do, let's pray. Father God, we just praise you and thank you for this opportunity to come before you and your people. And we just, we're seeking your wisdom, Lord. There's so many con artists out there. There's so many people out there that are milking money from the the sheep. They're fleecing the sheep, as it were. And they're buying corporate jets and mansions and huge properties and with bowling alleys and uh, three, three to five hundred thousand dollar cars, and and just outrageous uh, lifestyles of the rich and famous, and they call themselves Christian pastors. And Father God, there's so many people that give to them, expecting a return on their investment. They give because they give to get. They give to this cosmic vending machine in the sky. They think you are, and if they'll just give to these uh, flashy. Uh, high quote performing ministries that they're going to reap the benefit themselves and be rich as their pastors and lord we know that's wrong at the same time there are your people out there that have quit uh, their jobs quit their secular world to to plow the field as it were to work the word of god to minister it to your people and and your people want to know who these people are and how to give to them and i'm just asking you to reveal that in this message and in the mighty name of jesus i bind up any demonic spirits from interfering with me as far as what i say with regard to the word as is trying to twist it or distort it or to make it something that god does not intend i bind up all demonic spirits from trying to effectuate that i also come against any demonic spirits hassling or trying to interfere with the message with the listener in Jesus' mighty name. And Father, I just thank you for showing them the truth on these matters and helping us all to walk in it, Lord, to to support your work in this world, to to give of ourselves to help support your work. And I just praise you and thank you for just showing showing us how it's done. I give you all the praise and glory. And let no flesh speak, Father God. Let this be your podcast. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. So as someone that's been on both sides of this, it's you, you, you often wonder, you know, you're persuaded about tithing. You've been to a lot of these prosperity gospel churches and they want your tithe. Not only do they want your tithe, they want your offerings. And that's something I've always thought about is that these really rich mega churches with multiple campuses with, uh, you know, Starbucks and coffee shops and, and all these uh, basketball gyms and whatnot. And you just think about how much money they take in from thousands of people giving 10% of their salaries. And they also teach you to give of the money that you make before taxes. So some of these large churches are taking in outlandish amounts, even if 20 or 30% of their uh, congregants are giving their 10% plus offerings, then you know that uh, the the church is, is blowing up financially. And that's why... You see a lot of churches with really impressive structures and really impressive facilities and, you know, conference rooms with $40,000 
uh, tables and chairs and things of this nature. And that's because they're taking in a whole lot of money that a lot of people are giving because they think they're, they're being good. They think they're giving to God, but they're really giving to fleecers of the sheep, to the wolves in sheep's clothing. And so because of that, you know, a lot of people get really protective with their giving. And some people stop giving altogether. And some people actually leave the faith because of these prosperity gospel ministers, because they believe that they truly represent Jesus Christ in the church when they do not. And I'm reminded of a couple instances in the book of Acts where there was a disabled man begging for money and he begged from Peter and John and Peter looked at him and he said, silver and gold have I none, but what I have, I'll give to you in the name of Jesus, arise and walk, you know, and the man was healed at that very moment. But I'm not really trying to minister to you about healing. I'm ministering to you about the state of being of Peter was that at that time he had no silver or gold. And of course, it's also written in Acts that the money that they brought in was shared with all of the people that were in their quote commune, if you want to call it that. And this is not, I'm not trying to promote communism on the governmental sense or socialism or anything like that, but I'm saying that people, Christians, when they come together and they're not acting in a malevolent way, they're acting uh, in selfless ways they share with one another and nobody lacks that's how it should be but if you look at the modern church it is more like animal farm written by george orwell and communist rule where the people at the very top are really loaded and all the congregants are like the are like the serfs that are providing to the kings and the queens and it's 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 medieval all over again. It's just modern day medievalism where there is an elite class of people that are at the top of the church and they are milking all the money. And of course, there'll, there'll, be, there'll be a lot of employees that work for these churches for free. They're, they're all volunteers. They're not paid. They'll have a paid staff and uh, they won't, um, but they'll also have many, many volunteers who aren't paid that are giving of themselves. These are the true givers. And of course, of course those are the low level serfs. Having said all of that, let's also think back to to Paul. This was sort of at the end of his ministry when he was going to Jerusalem and he knew that he was going to be, you know, taken to Rome. He said in Acts 20, verse 33, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Ye yours, yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered under my necessities and to them which were with me. I've showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than re- to receive. And so a lot of ministers have forgotten that, that they, you know, Paul actually worked. He, he was a tent maker, according to the scriptures. And so now that does not mean that he didn't receive money because we're going to go through scriptures where he did receive money, but there were times where he worked. And I will testify in my own situation that there have been times where I've worked and times where I haven't worked. In the secular world, that is. I'm obviously working for the ministry and that's a lot of hard work. I'm not trying to discount work as it were for ministries it is work it's hard work but i mean just from the secular perspective where you're taking in a weekly or bi-weekly check and god provided for my needs in every case and he led me to go one way or another it just so happens at the moment that i'm not working in the secular world though obviously i'm working on the ministry but i worked up until march there was a time several years ago i only made eight thousand dollars that year And uh, some of that was through working a secular job, but most of it was through ministry. And I would dare say that I suffered no need that year. $8,000 is way under poverty, but God provided all my needs. I felt no poorer per se than I did when I was making a lot of money. You know, I mean, of course I couldn't do all the things that I was doing when I say a lot of money, but when I was making normal money, which is a lot of money compared to $8,000, but, uh, I didn't feel like I lacked anything. And you can see that, that, you know, showing the pattern that God's ministers are not walking in great wealth. Think about when Jesus sent them out, sent out the 12, and he also sent out the 70 to go do uh, ministry. When he sent them out during his time on earth, the scripture, Matthew 10, verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
And as you go, preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet stays, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Okay, so he's saying to them, don't take any money with you. Don't take anything additional, anything extra with you. No silver, nor brass, nor scrip. Don't take any money with you. And he says, for the workman is worthy of his meat. So he's saying two things there. He's telling the, the ministers and the pastors that you don't need to care about money. You need to care about doing my will in the earth. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will add, be added unto you. But you will be provided for, and he will provide for you through other means, through other people a lot of times, and, and miraculous happenings. But for the most part, it's you're working out the word for people, and because you're doing that, God's providing to you through, through those people. And I'm going to talk about that further from the epistles, but first let's talk about the 70 that they were sent out in the same matter. It says in Luke 10, verse 1, After these things the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. He said, Go your ways. Behold, I sent you forth as lambs among wolves. Again, here the same statement. Carry neither purse, nor script, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. Nothing additional. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall be upon it. If not, it shall return unto you again. And in that house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. So here again we have this depiction of don't take anything with you, but trust the people of God to be, to be used as provision to provide you with the food that you need and, and a roof over your head. And so... God's led me on that journey on multiple occasions, and it's been quite miraculous every time. And I praise Him for that. I'm in that situation now, and God has provided the roof over my head, and I'm never without food. I even have food for my dog, and He has made provision, and I praise Him for that. And I'm believe me, I am not rich. Like I can't like say I'm going to drive across the country right now because there's not that kind of money. But I know whatever I need, I have, and wherever He wants me to be, He'll He'll make the provision for it. I guess what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of people in the same situation as these apostles and the 70 disciples were that Jesus was sending out. There, there's a lot of people in that situation now because they're not involved in the brick and mortar church with, that have their erect phallus steeples on top and, and that are fleecing the sheep and that are businesses and that don't care about the true word of God. They're not telling the truth to you about Christmas or Easter or Sunday Sabbath. They're not telling the truth to you about uh, so many things related to the Holy Spirit and his function and the gifts of the Spirit. And they have all kinds of demonic kundalini spirits operating in them. And a lot of these churches are run by Mason, Freemasons and Satanists that are actually there to try to take you off track and down the broad road of, that leads to destruction. So there are few people that are actually out preaching the gospel the way Jesus wants it preached. And they are doing that, but they are out coming to you in the same way that John the Baptist did from a wilderness perspective. They're the ones that are like John the Baptist was out by the river and people had to come, come out. You know, he was in the wilderness. They had to come out to see him. And there are many, many people that God is raising up right now that are in, in that situation. They're, they have not been led to be involved in any, any church body or function or denomination. One of the, what, 22,000 denominations there are, they're not involved in that. They just, God took them off on their own like he did John the Baptist. They studied and read the word of God on their own, and God taught them himself what to believe about the scriptures. He taught them the truth. And because they hungered and thirsted for righteousness, he filled them. And so there are many people that God's raising up, and yet these people are being overlooked by the people in the church. Even people that are starting to come out of untruth and are listening to them, they're not really giving to them yet. They still, they're still not sure. There's a lot of people that are in the church that are coming out. They're still not sure about these one-offs, these, these John the Baptists out in the wilderness. They're not sure if this is of God or not. They're still in the middle. They're still kind of confused because they need to study out all these things that these people in the wilderness are actually, you know, speaking out, you know, be it on YouTube or podcasts like what God has me doing or, or what, uh, and or any other method, you know, it's just hard for sometimes for people to figure out if, if they're the one. So 
I'm going to kind of come back to this idea uh, which Paul is going to address where he uses the terminology, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. And in fact, I'm going to go to that idea right now. Paul writes about the same thing that, you know, Jesus said the wor- the workman is worthy of his hire. And Paul wrote it uh, in a similar vein. He quoted from Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. It says, thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. And so that's talking about when you have an ox that's pulling a plow or implement through the through the corn they would try to muzzle the ox and put something over his mouth so he wouldn't eat the corn and the scripture god says no don't do that he's earned the right to get some of that corn because he's doing the heavy load of pulling this heavy implement so don't muzzle that ox and so how does this apply to people that minister the gospel? So go with me to 1 Corinthians 9, verse 3. He says, Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord in Cephas? He's obviously under some scrutiny with regard to accepting money from the church. And he says, Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord in Cephas? Or I only in Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? So he's basically saying, do we not have the power to stop working and just receive of the church because of all the work that we've done in, in, in delivering the word to the people? He says next, who goeth a warfare at any time at his own charges? So what does that really mean in that old English? He's saying, which soldier goes to war and is not paid by the government that sends him to go to war? He's saying, who goes to war working for someone else as their soldier and pays his own way. That's what he's asking there. And then he says, who planteth a vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not the milk of the flock? And goes on to say, say I these things as a man. He's, you could tell he's pretty pissed. He says, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God not take care for oxen? Or saith he it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And there he's he's talking about the Levitical priesthood. They're the ones that received of the tithes and they got the 10%. They had no other inheritance, those Levitical priests. They had no inheritance in Israel. All they had, their inheritance was the tithes and the provision of God. And then he says, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So when you see somebody that is ministering the gospel and they're in the same condition that, that you know, we read about Paul and Peter and John, and these guys aren't making themselves rich, you know, they're just being provided for their, their basic needs. It reminds me of that proverb that's, that says that, and, you know, I'm kind of paraphrasing. It says that, you know, God, give me enough that I don't steal, but not too much that I become arrogant. That's the situation that you find these apostles in that, that they're always provided for and, you know, they may not even own their own homes. I don't own anything. I don't own any property at all except for my car and my music equipment and my recording equipment. That's it. And I stay on other people's properties when I'm doing ministry. It have been such a big blessing to me to allow me to do that, to be able to focus on this. And of course, I help around the, the, the farm where I'm staying now. I help out. You know, I mow all the grass. It's quite a big property. So I take care of those things. I do things, you know, inside and outside of the house to, to make things better here. But for the most part, it's been a free gift to me. And yeah, it has required a lot of work. So it's not exactly free, but the people aren't like lording that over me. I'm doing things on my own time and in my own way, because I want to, I I don't want to um, be in this house and, and, and take advantage in that sense. So having said all that, I'm trying to just give you the definition of somebody that's worthy of being given to. And I'm not trying to say, hey, everybody give to me. I'm just trying to show you who the people are that God's using in these last days and not trying to puff my puff myself up. I'm trying to preach to you as much to get you to give to other people that are ministering to you um, as much as you would give to me. So what I'm trying to say is that 
It's these types of people that have laid their lives on the line and that are trusting God and putting all their faith in God and that are really the most important thing of all that is that they're telling the truth. And they're telling the truth even though it's causing their numbers to be smaller. You know, the number of people coming awake now has grown rapidly. And that's amazing. But for a long time, people that were preaching truths like what we've talked about, they've been few and far between and they were preaching to themselves. But now God is really bringing uh, forward a, a revival of sorts of truth. You know, and I'm not talking about a, a Billy Graham crusade revival. I'm talking about people in their own lives coming to the knowledge of the truth through God's Holy Spirit and the reading of Scripture and having that those truths um, reinforced by these people that are out in the wilderness that are speaking the truth and that conviction's coming to the people that are hearing it. And then once they hear it, those people that hear it are having major changes in their lives. And that's another marker for whom you should give to. Is your life being changed by the word of God that's being brought to you for the better? And I'm not talking about for the better in a self-help sort of way, like Joel Olstein helps change your life for the better. You get richer and you have more money and a bigger house and a bigger car. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about do they change your life to where you feel closer with God, where things that are in your life that um, are that had put a wedge in between you and God are taken away? Are they helping you to identify sin and to get clean so that you inherit eternal life? These are the people that, in my view, that are worthy to be given to. And there's a big line of demarcation between them and these prosperity gospels that I always point, prosperity gospel preachers that I always point out. You know, and there's many other like mainline denominational teachers and preachers that are very affluent and they have the, the, the big church in town made of all red brick and the big steeple, the pagan steeple on the top. You know, these people, they, they don't have want for anything and they're hoarding too. You know, at some point, should a ministry get so blessed? If they're that blessed, should they not say to the people that are giving into the ministry, hey, why don't you bless another work now? We have enough. Wouldn't they say that instead of building five or six campuses across town and living in $1.7 million mansions and, uh, you know, driving super expensive cars and living the high life and shop, shopping Nordstrom's for shoes and whatnot instead of, you know, pay less? <laughs> now, I'm not saying you have to have pay less shoes to, to be a minister of God, but God will provide all those things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and he'll, he'll give you the provision. So again, we're trying to like, what, who is it that you should give to and what type of person should they, they be that you give to? So let's just continue on just a little bit longer with the idea of thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn because Paul also mentioned it, mentions it when talking to Timothy. He says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So we see here that he's talking about blessing those in the church, the, the elders, those that are leading you, that are working the word to bring you revelation from God, to help you to walk uh, more closely with God, to help you to stay on the, the narrow, the straight and narrow path. These people are supposed to be provided for. And that's the people that you should consider, whether or not you believe in tithing or not. If you listen to a message, uh, a preached message, whether it's on the internet or in your own life. And after that, you, you, you feel like your life, that God has literally brought you deliverance and changed your life through that message and brought you closer to him and brought you freedom. That's a person that you should sincerely consider a blessing and providing provision for. And if that person's an honest one, if they get overly provided for, they're going to either return that money to you and ask you to give it somewhere else, or they're going to uh, re reapply that money elsewhere. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're not greedy. Which brings me to my next scripture that we'll point out is in 1 Timothy as well. It says, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker. And then really the one I'm here is not greedy of filthy lucre. Lucre is money. He's not a greedy man. 
He's not thinking about money. He's not seeking first the money. He's actually doing everything in his power to uh, plow out the word of God, to pull up the information that you need to help you become a better follower of Christ and to cement and secure your relationship with Christ so that you can walk this straight, narrow path right into the kingdom of heaven for eternity. I mean, that's what these people are doing. So their minds are not set on the money. They're not doing anything for the money. They're doing it for the love of God. They're doing it for you, but they're really doing it because of God's love for you, that they are expressions of God's love for you. And again, not giving back into someone's life who has done such a work in your life, you know, in a way that's selfish. It's a, it's a bit narcissistic to not try to give back. You can also pay it forward in the sense that you can help people with the same things that you've been helped with in the future. But for me personally, you know, especially in the beginning of my walk, if someone fed into my life, I tried to bless them, you know, and I, I did tithe. And I remember there was um, a guy who had made a Bible software app. And I can't remember, it was in the early days. I think it was on a Kyocera smartphone. So we're talking in the 90s. And the guy was even from like Hong Kong or something. And uh, he had an email contact. And I was just so blessed that I could read my Bible on my phone every day that I wanted to bless him. I wanted to give him my tithe for that week. This guy had ministered the word of God into my life. He had gone through all the trouble of creating this application. And, um, you know, I wanted him to be blessed. And he wouldn't accept it. He refused to accept it. He said, I, I did this for the Lord, and uh, thank you, thank you very much. I wish he would have received it anyway, but he didn't, and I, I commend him for that. But that's kind of the point that I was being fed by them. There were there were times where the back before the internet became big, there were a lot of newsletters out there. and people would send newsletters for free, I think even. And I would bless those newsletters with my tithe, you know, every few months. Because I wasn't, you know, those were times when I wasn't really in a church. And I would go ahead and bless them with the tithe. Because, I mean, they were doing a lot of work to publish these things. They paid for the postage. I mean, they were, they were doing a lot to get these things out. And they deserve to be blessed. And they were revealing a lot of things. You know, I remember there was a newsletter by Psycho Hearsay Awareness. I used to get in the 90s that was really big at uncovering psychology's influence on Christianity and how demonic it was and also the influence of um, Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, that really helped me get a good solid bearing on, you know, those two major tentacles of Satan that were reaching into the church through AA and through psychology. And it just, it was a great newsletter and it was no problem for me to bless them. And so in this day and age of online resources that are a lot of times they're free, um, if you're really getting blessed, I think you should bless those whom are blessing you. And you don't have to give your entire amount of monthly giving. or You don't have to dump all of that on one ministry. Let's say just for a round number, this month you're going to give $100. Let's say you go to a church that really blesses you. And, and then there's two other ministries online or some other resource that's really been blessing you too. You give 80 bucks to the church and 10 to one of the ministries and 10 to the other ministry. And that's that percentage there, that's not a hard and fast number. I'm just throwing out an idea that you can just pray that through and just say, God, you know, this is how much I feel you're leading me to give. How much should I give here? How much should I give there? How much should I give there? These are the places that are helping me walk more closely with you. And I think that if you do that, even, you know, these online ministries, if you give just small amounts to them, just a dollar or five dollars or, you know, just a small amount, you have no idea how much that encourages that minister so what's really nothing for you, you know, a dollar or two dollars, it's telling that minister that, man, okay, God is encouraging me to keep going. You know, and it's not that they that dollar is really going to help them that much. But if a, if a lot of people give a dollar or five dollars, 20 people give five dollars, that's that's a hundred dollars. And so that could help that minister a lot, but it's not even the money. It's more about that minister seeing that provision and seeing man, these people, they actually appreciate what I'm doing. 
And I know that if you do that for some of these ministries online that are really blessing you, again, it doesn't have to be a huge amount. Then you're going to bless them and God's going to be able to continue to encourage them through you. These people have encouraged you. How can you encourage them back? Subscribing and comments and, and, and emails, those are all great and that's helpful. But that doesn't necessarily pay the bills for these people because a lot of these people have turned turned off their advertising. I, don't, I never turned on my advertising because I didn't want to have advertisements on my videos that would be contrary to the message I'm trying to send. And that was almost guaranteed. And I didn't want you to have to put up with that. So I don't even, I, I, I bought the YouTube Red myself and I don't even see ads anymore on anybody's but that's expensive. It's like 10 bucks a month, but I found there's, it, it helped me with some things with like bandwidth and, and, and it just, it seems to work better uh, when I use it. But the point I'm trying to make is that if these people aren't trying to make money on advertising and they're not trying to sell you anything and they're out there blessing you day in and day out and they're, they're helping you find the truth, throwing a dog a bone, uh, financially to Paul's point and helping them so that they can provide for themselves it doesn't always have to be money either. You could write the ministry and say, hey, um, what is it that you need in your ministry? And you never know. They may need something something strange. Like, for example, on this farm, I need some farming implements. <laughs> and believe me, I'm not trying to fish for that, but I'm saying you may have something that, that's trash to you that could be the minister's treasure that they that they need to to do whatever work that they're doing. So you could reach out um, to the ministry that's really blessing you and say, hey, I don't really have any money or a way to tie it to you, but do you, do you have any specific needs that maybe I have that I could just send your way, you know, or maybe they, they, could, they could use your time. You know, you never know what you could give back. A lot of times ministers are, are constantly being in demand to pray with people over the phone or email or in person or to have retreats or whatever. And they're in demand and they're constantly giving, 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 and they don't have a way, they don't have the time to get out there to go work in the world, in the secular world for a paycheck. And so for me, it's like to Paul's point, those are the people you need to be looking out for and wanting to bless them. I just don't want this to come off as me trying to like manipulate you like the prosperity gospel people do to give into this ministry. That's not what this is about. But I do believe what I'm saying is true, not only for you, but for myself, that people that are feeding into our lives, God expects us to feed back into their lives. And especially these people that have basically taken on almost, I don't want to call it vows of poverty, like the Catholic church, but they basically decided, I don't care if I get money or not, I'm going forward and preaching the gospel. And if those people are giving, 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 and you can see that and you can pray and you can discern that they are not out to uh, get filthy lucre for, for the sake of getting filthy lucre and that they just are uh, looking to God for provision, those are the people that you should give into their lives. You know, and it says the same thing about the deacons. Here he goes, likewise, must deacons be grave, not double tongue, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. So here again, leadership is, should not be greedy. That's not the point. It's not like these prosperity gospel people that are, you know, flying around in Gulfstream jets and, you know, jet aircraft. They're not even propeller planes. They're jets. They're corporate jets that they're out flying in, you know, and driving Bentleys and, and Rolls Royces and the like. These are not the people to whom you should be giving into. They have enough, <laughs> They're very sufficient. And beside all that, they're Satanists and they're drawing you down the wide road that leads to destruction. You need to get away from your Benny Hens. You need to get away from your, your Paula Whites, your Creflo Dollars, your T.D. Jakes, your Jesse Duplantis, your Joyce Meyer. All of these people are just fleecing the sheep and making themselves rich. And they're using the Word of God. They've made merchandise of the Word of God, like Peter said. In part, this podcast is preaching to those that should be giving into ministries. And some of this is preaching to you that are considering ministry or that are considering going out and doing ministry, but you don't have what you think is the wherewithal. You don't have the money necessary to do it. I want you to see again this idea that God told them to carry not, neither purse nor script nor shoes. You know, he told them not to bring, you know, silver or gold with them. But when they came back, 
Look what, look what he asked them. He, he said to them in Luke 22, verse 35, and he said to them, when I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked you anything? And they said, nothing. I've told this story in the past that one time I felt God led me to go to Seattle. I quit a job. I'd just gotten a job that they really pursued me about. It was going to be a decent enough living. And I just could not think about anything but going up to Seattle and doing some ministry up there. And so I quit the job and I went with like 500 bucks. Gas prices were $4.50 a gallon up there in Seattle by the time I got there. I had, well, I had more like $600. By the time I got there, I had nothing. I had no money left. I had like 140 bucks. I stayed there for 40 days. And it turns out that I ran out of fruit and I was walking down the street, literally like, I have no more fruit. I have no more food. And I was crying out to God and I had no money to go in a store and even buy an apple. And right then when I was being a big honking baby, I looked to my right and there was this wall. It was covered in vines and the vines were blackberries. So, you know, how you buy a little tray of blackberries, it's like six bucks, you know, it's crazy how expensive those things are if you buy them in the store. And there they were, organic black blackberries, just a wall that was like, 50, I'd say it was like 15 feet high and maybe 50 feet wide, just covered in them. And they were coming ripe. They weren't all ripe. So I basically ate on blackberries on that, on that thing every single day, as much as I pretty much wanted until I was full of them. So the point I'm trying to make is that God doesn't necessarily always have to provide through people. He can provide through the environment. He can provide through his own miraculous way of giving. And it was just really amazing how he did that. There was another time where I'd run out of money and I was on this farm and it had a little river running through it. And somebody had brought a fishing rod, but I had no bait. And I was really hungry for some meat. I had some food, but I just had no protein. I really wanted some protein. And, you know, I've fished in my life, but I never really got into it. It wasn't that big, big a deal for me. So I was no expert, but I was like, I have no bait. And I walked out in the field and there were all these grasshoppers. And I was like, okay, let's try it. And I went out and I just grabbed a grasshopper and I didn't even really know how to hook him. And I hooked him through the thorax and I went down to the river, cast him once, got a bite, second time, pulled the, pulled the fish out. So there I was hungry and God provided for me instantly. I mean, I didn't even have to like sit there and wait and hope. It was just like, bam, one nibble, second cast, pull the fish out, walked up. It was a brim. Anybody that's had brim know they taste great. They're a little bony, but it was enough protein to satisfy me. And I was just really happy. And God just blessed me. And he just showed me that I didn't need money to go to the grocery store. I needed to see other avenues as potential means of provision. I mean, there was a time where I don't eat pork because I do keep the diet that you find in the Torah. You know, no shellfish, things from the water need to have fins and scales, so no catfish. I mean, I I really do that. I think doing that diet keeps you healthy. Another thing it talks about is don't eat the fat. You know, we eat a lot of fat in the U.S. and there's a lot of heart disease, I believe, for that reason. Anyway, my dad didn't adhere to that diet. He made some pork and there was no other type of meat in the house when I was at his place. And there's a little pond on the farm and I did the same exact thing happen. I didn't, I've, I fished that farm just a handful of times and I said, you know what? I'm going to go catch me a fish. And I've, I've cast from uh, the, the shore from the little dock many times and caught nothing. And within five minutes, I'd caught that fish and came inside and prepared fish for myself. So the point I'm trying to make is that God is the provider. If you seek him first, the kingdom of God is righteousness. He will provide to you when you have need. And I'm telling the people that are pursuing ministry to embrace that and to not just be one track minded that you need actual real money. Uh, You know, think about Israel in the desert. I mean, they are getting manna showing up from heaven every single morning. Except for on Saturday, on the Sabbath, they didn't, manna wasn't there. They needed to collect enough on Friday for both days. But I mean, think about that miracle that God provided. And, you know, once the tribulation begins and halfway through when the false prophet lifts up the Antichrist and, and then you can't buy or sell without the mark of the beast, we aren't going to be able to use stores. We're going to have to pull fish out of the streams and other means of provision that God chose us for those of us that aren't beheaded during the uh, tribulation period. You know, it says in the scripture that, 
that uh, the Antichrist will make war against the saints and shall overcome them. So many of us will be captured and, and put up and beheaded, the scriptures say, but those that are will receive great honor because they are going to be the only ones resurrected at the beginning of the millennial reign and that will rule and reign with Christ. So don't love your life unto death. This life, I'm telling you, it's such, it's such a vapor. It doesn't matter how you go. If you're going to die, it doesn't matter how you go. You're going to instantly go into paradise if you're walking with Christ. And yeah, death hurts sometimes, but please don't fear it. Don't fear death. Do not fear it. Fear, fear him who can put you in hell. Have a good, healthy respect for God and his word and fear sinning and respect it. Have reverence for God and, and honor him by living an obedient life, keeping his commandments. And believe me, eternity at your death will start fast. And it will be amazing. You will not want to come back. Believe me when I tell you that. All right. Let's go through some scriptures that talk about being poor and yet rich. There's a proverb that says, There is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. Very rich people, a lot of them have nothing inside. They have no spiritual wealth. They may have physical wealth, but they are bitter. They are complainers. They are never satisfied. And they don't know God. You know, and that there's a big reason that Jesus said that how hardly will a rich man enter in heaven? It's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And he said that because if you trust in your riches, it's not that you can't have wealth and not go into the kingdom of God, but it's people that trust in those riches. That's where you go wrong. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. So going on, it says, There is he that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. So remember when Jesus was confronted with, the, with the, the young rich ruler and the rich ruler asked him what he could do to be perfect? He said, keep the commandments. And he, and he says, I've kept all the commandments from my youth up. And then he said to him, sell all you have, give to the poor and come follow me. And, I'll, I'll, and you'll have treasures in heaven. And the young ruler left very sorry because he couldn't do that. He trusted in his riches. And so that's why, you know, Jesus told us not to worry about where our provision comes from, but to put up our riches in heaven, our treasures in heaven. So when you see someone in ministry that's made themselves poor and you bless them, God will pay you back. Look here in Proverbs 19, verse 17, it says, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the poor, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. You can tell the ministers that are poor because they're the ones telling the truth. They don't have everybody you know, feeding them all their tithes and, and offerings uh, for that false gospel. Look at this uh, idea of being poor and rich again when Jesus is talking to the Laodiceans. He goes, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. He says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore, and repent. So he went into great pains to tell these rich people that they weren't rich. He told them, you're wretched, miserable, poor, and blind and naked. In his eyes, they look like a person that's had to live on the streets for a year and hasn't bathed or shaved or or washed their hair and uh, are just filthy. That's what they look like to him from the inside. Their outward appearance to other people is they look like they got it all together. They got everything they need. They got their manicures, their pedicures. You know, from a woman's standpoint, the perfect makeup, you know, the guy's got the perfect haircut, perfect clothing, thousands of dollars in, in name brand designer clothing, all of that God doesn't see. He doesn't see that. Men see that. Men look out on the outward appearance. But as it says in First Samuel, God was telling Samuel that, that he looks on the heart when he was having him choose David to be the next king after Saul. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And so in order for you to know who to bless, for those of you, you know, shifting gears back to those knowing who to give to, you really got to just examine again, here's the measure. Did I get, did I get helped? Did I get uh, delivered? Did I get some 
freedom, some feeling of closer proximity to God, did the, the burden get lifted from me? It was the person used of God to break some yoke off of you and to draw you closer to him. And if that happens, in my view, there is no reason to not give some provision to that person in whatever way that you can and help them because God is sending out his people now, the true ministers of his, of deliverance and of truth and of righteousness, his prophets. He's sending them out right now and they're not going to tell you they're a prophet. They're not going to say they're an apostle. And that's something I want to address too. A lot of people ask me about this. If they're calling themselves an apostle, I guarantee they're not. I want you to see John the Baptist as the perfect example. If you'll remember how humble he was when those Pharisees and Sadducees came out, when they said, who are you? He didn't answer them what the truth was. The truth was he was the greatest prophet that had ever walked the earth before or since Jesus. Jesus said that. He was the greatest prophet ever. And, but John the Baptist only spoke of himself as saying that he was a voice crying in the wilderness. That's it. Prepare the way of the Lord. He did not try to ascribe some title to himself. I, I've seen these two ministers or female ministers. One calls herself the uh, apostle and the other calls herself the armor bearer of the apostle and a prophetess. And these people are, I actually think they're witches because they just, they're people like them. They're throwing around titles in order to bamboozle people and hoodwink them and convince them that there's something they're not. So in my view, you should be looking for people that have humility and meekness and lowliness before God and mankind. And they're not trying to like toot their own horn. All they care about is ministering the word to you to help you get closer. And these are people that will minister words to you that you don't want to hear. And they don't care that you don't want to hear it. And they'll tell you anyway, if it's from the Lord, they don't care if they even offend you. All they care about is that you get it right with God. And that's the type of ministers God's sending forth right now. They don't care who they offend if, if it helps, him, helps that person avoid going to hell or walking in a way that puts that wedge, a big, bigger wedge between them and God. They're going to tell you the truth. They'll be kind and loving on the one hand, but they're also going to tell you the truth. These are the people that God's sending out right now. And these are the people that I think as a church, we need to be focused on helping accomplish that mission. And to do so without having to think about getting, uh, if, if they're really working that hard for the gospel, should these people really be out, you know, doing a secular job, you know, work in retail? Should a true minister of God be wasting his time when he could be helping more people or, or working the word of God more? I mean, that question was asked in the book of Acts. Let's go to that. Look here in Acts chapter 6. It says, In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there rose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Do you see that? So these people were wanting more service for their, um, for their widows. The Grecians had widows that were evidently there. And, you know, maybe they were of older age and they needed more help. And the apostles were seeing that, okay, you know, it's good to serve others. That's what we should do. But we, we can see that we're being distracted from the real purpose, which is to work the word of God, to pray and to minister the word to other people. And the distraction of having to do things that took them away from their main purpose, they recognize that. And so some people God is calling right now because the harvest is great and the laborers are few, they're being called to full-time ministry. And they're leaving jobs that may have been somewhat lucrative to them, or at least uh, provided to them everything that they needed. And now they've left those jobs and they're out there trying to work for the Lord and for God's people. And these are the people that the funds that were going to those uh, rascally thieves, the false gospel preachers, needs to be diverted to the real church if you're a real servant of, of God. You need to be giving it to the people that are preaching the word and they're not in these brick and mortar ministries 
that are, you know, with, like I keep saying, steeples on top and paganism being practiced therein and Sunday Sabbath and all that garbage. So I think we as a people really need to make a point of making sure that these people that are really uh, blazing the trail for the church by God's leadership, that they are provided for so that they can continue to blaze that trail without having to get sidetracked by activities that are going to take them, you know, such as working in the world and, you know, flipping burgers or, you know, serving food or any of these things that turn them away or, or, or cause them to have to leave off what God's really called them to do. And there's some of you pastors and ministers or people that are meant to be pastors and ministers that are listening now that you really want to do that. Sometimes you got to step out on faith and just pray and, and know that God's going to provide for you what you need. You realize pretty quick you don't need that much. You know, your your what you thought were needs before they they're no longer needs. You can go without a lot of stuff and live a lean life, and you'll you'll figure out pretty quick that if he has you on the move in any way, that the leaner you are, the better. The less stuff you have, the better, and the less responsibilities. If you cut down on your bills. Don't don't have any additional bills that you don't need. You, you're going to need a phone. You have a phone bill, and you're, if you have a car, you have car insurance. Try not to have payments. Cut down on payments. Do not ha- have a cheap car that you own. Don't have to have a, a monthly payment for that. Try to really control your overhead in terms of rent. If you can find a place, if you can, if you can own a cheap place in the country outright, I would rather do that than have an expensive place in the city that I've got a monthly note that I've got to meet. So pastors, you preachers, pastors, ministers, whoever you are, there's a lot you can do to make your life really lean where you don't have to stress out so much on how much you get in donations. And by all means, please don't use money to get caught up in making giant campuses. Can you get a building? Sure. But does your building have to be, you know, hold 10,000 people? No. Can you have multiple services? Yes. Can you do things that limit the need for money? Yes. At some point, when we can't buy or sell without the mark, you're not going to be able to own your church or rent a church anyway. You're not going to be able to pay taxes without the mark of the beast. Right now, it's more about almost like drive-by ministry in the sense that you're coming in and out of people's lives and ministering the word, but you don't necessarily have a roof over your head. At some point, some of us will be ministering in the wilderness. That last three and a half years of the tribulation will be on the run. We'll be ministering the word of God and faith in the wilderness. And that wilderness can mean a lot of different things. I don't want to spend a lot of time defining that right now. But the point is, is that having brick and mortar now and getting tied down to things of this earth is not necessary. Our ministry in this day and hour can be more like what John the Baptist had out by the river. Jesus himself traveling, walking the earth. We can be in one place and people can come to you know, outdoor pavilion type things. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to do ministry without getting tied down to a monthly note and insurance and all these things that cost money. And so I guess what I'm trying to say to the ministers is that dial back. Don't put on yourself a burden of trying to get as many donations as you need and, and, and making yourself a burden on the flock when it's not necessary. And I'm telling the flock to figure out who it is that are the John the Baptist of our day and be a blessing to them. Don't just receive a blessing from them. Yes, it, for them, it's more blessed for them to give than to receive, but it's also more blessed for you to give than to receive and help that ministry that helped you in some way. And also let them launch you out into your own ministry. You know, as once you get right with God and, and, and they help you get delivered and go help others too, you know, pay it forward. But also don't neglect to bless the people of God that are doing the hard work of ministering the word and bringing the truth, especially in these last days when there's so many lies out there. It's important to bless the ministers that are bringing the truth. So I think it's a good point to stop and uh, just give God all the praise and glory and pray. And Father God, I just praise you and thank you for ministering unto both people that uh, give and people that receive, whether it's the uh, the people that need to bless their, their ministers that have ministered the word and the truth unto them, or, or the people that are the ministers, Lord. Thank you for revealing us to us insights of how to be on either side of that equation through this podcast. I praise you and thank you for your presence here. I thank you for blessing those who listen to just know who they should bless, not just through money, Lord, but through prayer, 
through putting these ministers up in prayer. That's really important. And also through the volunteering or trying to help them in other ways. So Father God, I just thank you for waking up your people to not be so self-centered in forgive the expression, sucking on the teat of the ministers without um, giving back, Lord. I just thank you for helping them to know how to give back and in which way they should give back. And I praise you and thank you for doing that. And I thank you and praise you for helping us as ministers to live lives that are really lean, like what you did and what um, John the Baptist did and what Paul and, and, and Peter and all the other apostles were doing in giving to others too when they receive. So I just praise you and thank you for making making it all fair because you're a very fair God. I praise you and thank you for all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Saints, I, I thank you for listening through to this point. And again, all everything that we have on this ministry is free. You can go to www.reverbnation.com forward slash without spot or blemish ministry music. And there'll be a link below for that. And you can download all that music for free if you like it. And then also uh, we have a blog spot without spot or blemish dot And if you'd like to donate, you can do so at the link below, the PayPal link below. But if you go directly to PayPal, our handle and our email is without spot at gmail.com. You can email us there uh, with praise, uh, praise reports, prayer requests uh, and the like. And uh, let us know how you're doing. Again, it takes me a week or two to get back to everybody. The volume has increased a lot. Forgive me for that but I will continue to respond to those in the order that they're received. And uh, just God bless you. Pray for this ministry. Pray for all the ministries for, that are feeding you. And again, don't be afraid to donate a little bit of money to any ministry that's blessed you and brought you freedom. It doesn't have to be a giant amount. It could, like I said, be a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars. Don't be afraid to just reach out with a small donation. For all those that have donated to this ministry, God bless you. You've been a great help. Be blessed a hundredfold. And uh, I just uh, praise God for, for you and for your desire and willingness to give back into a ministry. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you on the next podcast. God's heart does yearn For you to be Among his kin for eternity But so far away If you walk and stay On the other side With the gates of hell you will collide a Jezebel, a Delilah too That Sheba on a roof, a look in you were through A Jezebel, a Delilah too That Sheba on a still come back to you can still come back to come back come back to God my dear friend come back this isn't how Oh